Afternoon, everyone. All still awake, I hope. Um, I'm here to take you through to the end. Not often I get to follow Michael McIntyre, is it? I mean, what a tremendous thing. I've just seen Michael there. <laughs> He's up there. <coughs> Could you do more of the sort of backwards movement next time? It's fantastic. That's okay, next lecture. Uh, I'm here to talk about awkward situations when things go wrong. I don't know what sort of days that you have. Um, you all love days where nothing goes wrong, haven't you? I used to have days where I arrived in and say to my nurse, local anesthetic, please, she'd say, get it yourself. And I'd know things were not going to go pretty well from then. I'm going to look at three tools during this presentation for challenging situations. And we'll talk what I, what I mean by a challenging situation in a second. Show the principles of delivering bad news, because we have to deliver bad news sometimes. Okay? And the bad news could be you're losing your teeth. The bad news is you could be losing the teeth because of me. So it depends what the bad news is. I'm going to look how you make, make yourself and your team safer, because that's what I want from the end of the day. I want you leaving here today safer than you were coming in. Illustrate some key issues in managing dissatisfaction, and we're going to have to manage dissatisfaction. Okay, we're going to make mistakes. Okay, uh, we're going to have a fight with someone at some stage in our career. I don't mean physical, but some of you might. Okay, some of you might hit a patient. Some of you might scream at them. Some of the patients might scream at you. Okay. So we have to manage those situations. And at the very end, a little bit about clinical records, a thing called the three C's. A couple of myths. There are some people that we've dealt with and over my years in DPL, um, there are some people driving this gate every morning on their way to work. Okay? And the funny thing is, is that some of you may think that this is to do with them being a good or a bad dentist. And the myth is that your quality of clinical care has got very little to do with your risk profile. There's very little research out there to say that bad dentists get in trouble a lot. Okay? And so the real key here is that, and what I mean by high risk, those who get sued a lot, those who get a lot of complaints to regulatory bodies, those who have unsolicited complaints, that's where a patient writes, I hate you. Okay? And then those who are hated at work. If you're hated at work, there's a fair chance you're high risk. And there's another phrase I'll use now, and at this stage you may not have noticed it because you're probably not at the age where you get burnout. But if you notice one or two of your patients are really difficult, that's normal. If you notice that they're all really difficult, it's probably not them. Okay? So if that happens to you at some stage in career and they're all difficult, it's probably not them. So our sort of play for today is we're going to talk about what's challenging, what we're not good at seeing, why we're very predictable, what do I say now when things go wrong. Uh, so you're not very happy, are you, is what you might be saying to a patient, and it wasn't my fault, what happens when it isn't your fault and you're accused. So what's challenging? Well, let's have a wee look at this young dentist. Okay, Mrs. Weiner, um, there doesn't appear to be anything wrong. I'd say your teeth look pretty healthy. It's Vena, dear, not Weena. Oh, don't be silly, there must be something wrong. It's been aching since I flew to Florida. Oh, it's probably uh, from the air pressure in the cabin on your flight. Are you saying the flight caused my toothache? Um, yeah, well, that's one way you could put it. Um, there are many ways that um, cabin pressure can actually cause um, toothache. Oh. I suppose that's something you've learned in your years of experience, is it? Is there another, more senior dentist I can speak with? Perhaps the lady dentist I normally see. Um, I'll see, but I mean, usually she's really busy. <laughs> I suspect that's because she knows what she's talking about. Well, um, I'll see if she's able to pop in. Yes, do. Now, what would you like to do with Mrs. Weiner? <laughs> At this moment in time, are you feeling warm and cuddly? Anyone like to bury her alive? Okay, any journalists in here? We'd like to hug her if there's a journalist in here. But she doesn't leave you with a warm feeling, does she? And I bet you you've had some patients like that, isn't it? Some patients say, tell your dad I'm here. And you're thinking, listen, dog breath, I spent six years trying to get to this place. Two years VT with Mad Mick, and now look at me here, and you're telling me where's my dad? So all of these situations happen. That's a challenging situation. Here's another one. 
23-year-old dentist. I know this dentist well. Patient at 10, prep on an upper five. This dentist really, really liked Crown and Bridge work. Knew that in college. And prepared a fantastic book of preparation. You know, Schillenberg, Hobo and Whitset, eat your heart out. Produced a fantastic palatal preparation. Chamfer, even before chamfers were known about. <laughs> At which stage I took out my mirror. And shit, they were on two different teeth. Just in case you think you're the only ones who make mistakes, okay? That was me at the age of 23. Bright-eyed, about to save the world from periodontal disease. Okay? And it's what we know as a sphincter-tightening moment in the profession. Okay? It's a challenging situation. I had to handle it. Other than crying. Okay? New treatments. Every day we face new treatments. Even the old guys face new treatments some days. Boredom. Have you faced boredom yet? Of course you have. How boring is it to wait for an impression to set? So we go face painting, don't we? <laughs> yeah. Problem is when we face paint, we create distortion. Then we wonder why something doesn't fit. But it's boring. Face painting is fun. Difficult patients, new assistants. Why can't they just give us really experienced assistants who know exactly everything we think without saying anything? Unfamiliar task. Halt. Hungry, angry, late, and tired. If you're hungry, you're dangerous. Some people go to work angry, some people leave it angry. Late. Any of you are ever late? My patients used to bring sandwiches, flasks, sleeping bags. Overbooked, underbooked, ambiguity, we're just not sure. There's, our body language is saying there's something wrong. And one of the things that we're going to look at is, <clears throat> no one teaches us this. The Yerkes and Dodson in 1909 worked out that the more aroused we are during a day, the better our performance is. Okay? You have terrible minds, really, some of you. <laughs> I said a day. You shouldn't be doing that in the day. I'm not talking about the evening. We come in here about 8 o'clock in the morning, and basically, we're not capable of doing that. You need a cup of coffee to get going, a couple of simple things to get going. You really should not be doing heart surgery here. Okay? And then during a day, as we get a little bit more stimulated, we perform better and better and better until we're sort of cruising. Now, this could be sort of 2 or 3 in the afternoon, or it could be 9 o'clock in the morning. If you're up at maximum performance at 9, the day is not going to get any better. Just remember that. Okay? Would you prefer your heart surgeon to be operating on you when he or she is on the way up here or on the way down there as a choice? On the way up, okay? Now, everyone has circadian rhythms, and some people, if you're stressed or you're having a bad day, you could be here by 10 or 11 in the morning, and you could be down here at 4 or 5 in the afternoon. And so if you're getting a lot of challenges at you, you're more likely to be on the downward slope at the end of the day. And so we should be looking at a making our appointment books so that we all have our difficult situations and challenging situations here. And really, we should never be doing challenging situations at the end of a day or at the start of a day. And sometimes we book our really difficult patients at the end of a day because we want to go and have a wine afterwards, don't we? We want to immerse ourselves in alcohol or something like that to get over it because it's so traumatic, our line in a dark room. The problem is that person who's also a nervous person has had their whole day waiting to see you in which case they're probably down here as well. And we wonder why it goes wrong. So if you've ever noticed that when you see one of those patients at four in the afternoon, those of you who still use amalgam, and the marginal ridge won't stay on, it's never the easy patient, is it? It's never the patient with the big mouth. It's the patient where you say open and they say it is open. <laughs> okay, it's always the anxious patients that it happens on. The other thing is we're not very good at seeing things. Now we have a room full of 200 people here. I'm gonna see how many of you might be good pilots. The first is, on a Friday afternoon, the patient attends in pain. I don't know what your practices are like, but on a Friday afternoon, when someone, someone sends up in pain, it's not a warm, cuddly feeling. This was actually a patient who hadn't previously finished their course of treatment. And for those of you who qualified in Bristol, this is early caries. And for the rest of us, 
For the rest of it, it's an extraction. It's got about off to that place in the sky where teeth go. And um, the problem is, this is Friday afternoon. You know the local's not going to take easily. And what's going to happen to that tooth? It's going to break, isn't it? Even in the best hands, even in those wonderful Max Facts you spoke about, Michael, they're going to smash that. It's Friday. It's a double book patient. You're angry with the patient. You've got a bit too much energy in the right or left hand, depending on which surgery you have, and the tooth cracks. After six days, the patient has a tender with trismus and difficulty chewing. The teeth don't meet properly, so the dentist adjusts the bite. The patient is anxious as she hasn't eaten for six days. Now, this is the equivalent of you having a puncture in your car and letting down the other three tires to make it feel more even. Okay? It will feel more even, but it's not going to solve the problem. Anybody got an idea what's happening here? It's a fractured jaw, okay? It's a fractured jaw. Day eight, the dentist, no reduction in pain, so we give two antibiotics. So this is a week, eight days afterwards. Dentist one, there were two dentists involved. Second dentist was six months qualified. Dentist one was 16 years. Appointment made for a week, which the patient didn't keep. And then after three weeks, the patient is still feeling unwell. Acute pain is reduced, but the teeth are very sore. The dentist takes an x-ray, and there it is. Massive big fracture. And you see, the great danger is that we sit here in a room like this and we think we'd never do that. We would never do that. And so I'm going to give you a reality check because it could happen to any one of you tomorrow. Why? Because you're human. You might have prevented it with a couple of different things. You might not have. We must learn and change to move on. If you don't learn from these situations, they leak. I don't know. What, we all make mistakes, but they eat at you, don't they? Because none of us go out in the morning to harm somebody. So they eat at you, and they eat at you for days, and they eat at you for weeks. And just picture yourself getting onto a Ryanair flight. No, don't picture yourself getting onto, but picture yourself getting onto a Ryanair flight and the captain saying, evening, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Ryanair F4256 to Dublin. Frankly, I've had a bad week. <laughs> I really couldn't give a damn if we get to Dublin tonight. I'm prepared to take this plane up in the air and see what happens after that. <laughs> okay? Now, I know some of you are thinking, that's pretty good for Ryanair, but that's a different <laughs> issue. Okay? We're going to talk about accountability, because it's big, big problems at the moment. You've just seen mid-staffs this week, and the Minister for Health turning around and saying, calling the police in. You know? And I'm going to say, unless you're willing to take the people at the top and the bottom, and that includes, there's no point in having the police and mid-staffs. It's not going to change a thing. Bristol Heart Babies, nothing changed after that because they're looking for people to hang, as opposed to learning in the system. And so we need to look at both the system and that. So let's have a look. It's because we're human, systems are designed, they're not well designed for humans, and we need to design our systems to take account of human errors. So unless people design our work systems to take account of human error, we have a problem. So let's see how many of you could be a pilot. This is a test. I'm going to ask you to do a test in a minute. If you've done this, just sit back and be quiet. I'm going to show you two basketball teams, one wearing white, one wearing black. I'm going to ask you to count how many times the team in white passed the ball. There is a difference between male and female here, and I'm not going to tell you in advance so as not to upset the males. Okay, so that's the first thing. So how many times do the team in white pass the ball? Let's have a look. Okay, what's the answer? 16, 14, who said 14? Okay, 15s, 17s, any 18s, 19? You've just all watched the same video. How can we have five different answers? Anything else? A what? A gorilla, someone said. <laughs> you okay, sir? You've been eating mushrooms with your lunch or something like that? <laughs> How many people here saw a gorilla? Okay, quite a few. How many people here didn't see a gorilla? Put your hands up. Don't be shy. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's a few. Okay, just hands. I know it's the people in Grilton. Oh, I saw them, but people didn't. Okay. 
There's only one way to check this, and that's to have a look at the video again. Because now we have some ambiguity in the room. Is there a gorilla there or not? The answer is 16, by the way. It doesn't mean you can't count. Okay. Here he is. I know it is hard to believe you've missed it, isn't it? It's not as if he's crept in on the floor, is it? Yeah, you know, I mean, this is sort of someone who's just walked in, who's banged his chest, and who's walked out. I call this a fractured jaw. Okay? I call that a fractured jaw. How could anyone miss something so obvious? We've just seen someone miss something so obvious. It's called a fractured jaw. Now, my guess is it's because of black and white, and it's an awful video. So let's have a look at the latest version of the same video. So count how many times the players wearing white pass the ball. How many times the players wearing white pass the ball? It's the voice of Daniel Chabris. And all girls now, because we ban males, because they can't count. The answer is 16, of course. Yep. Oh, very good, because you know the answer before, so it's going to be the same answer again, probably. And you all saw the gorilla that time, didn't you? Anybody else see the gorilla that time? Because you're in trouble if you didn't. I mean, you're really <laughs> in the wrong profession, frankly. Um, anybody notice anything else? One of the girls is missing. Okay, the one you were staring at, yeah? Okay. <laughs> um, Okay, so one of the girls is missing. Okay, anything else? Many people didn't notice that there's a girl missing at the end. Oh, hands up, okay. So it's, it's roughly 50% every time we do this, okay? This is, our, this is the work of Daniel Chabris and Christopher Simons. Uh, Nobel Prize winning work, okay? In an audience of any audience. And the thing is, if I had a cameras on all your eyes, you'll have tracked the gorilla that you missed. As you'll have tracked the girl that is no longer there. Anything else? The background has changed. It's from red to gold. Anybody notice that? Anybody not notice that? Okay, so plenty of you there. But there's only one way to resolve this, and that's to have a look at the video again. See, I'm getting the feeling Many that this isn't a very the observant audience. wearing white past the ball. 6 girls. And this is the girl that this gentleman over here is in love with. jumped. So there's two, two girls in black at the end. As the gorilla came on, the other girl jumped. Many times the players Let's wearing white passed the ball. The video slowed down. I'm just watching it to see if we can do it without the jump. Again, here's this girl. I have our phone number, sir, but the judge told me to stop using it. And you'll see her back off as the gorilla comes on. Okay? So that's what happens there. And so that is the famous work of Daniel Chabris and Christopher Simons. You see, we confuse what's easily noticed when it's expected with what should be noticed when it's unexpected. And even looking at that, a lot of you will have not noticed the fact that there's two widths in that. And so those of you who've got all three wrong, you're probably feeling very depressed now. Okay? It's got no indication as to whether you could be a pilot. It's also got no indication as to whether you're a good dentist. But it just is an indication that you're human, and three times in a row you could miss a fractured jaw. On day six, on day eight, and on day 21. When the patient comes back with a pattern of symptoms that look like a dry socket. You see, as humans we pattern match. And on the first occasion you weren't looking for a gorilla, so you didn't see it. On the second occasion you were looking for the gorilla, so you saw it, but you saw nothing else. And the whole thing is, what we see is not what our eyes see. Our eyes are not video cameras. 
That's strange. Our eyes are not video cameras. What we see is based on what we expect and what our experience is. And the more experience you have, the more you'll see. The less experience you have, the less you see. Aviation industry worked this out a long time ago, which is why pilots don't crash into mountains as often as they used to. It's hard to believe you'd miss a mountain in front of you in a plane. It's a clue, isn't it? You know, no light. But it happened. It doesn't happen now. Some dental examples of the invisible gorilla, we see aesthetics but miss disease. And so when we criticize the dentist to say, how could anyone have missed the caries there? It's because we were only looking for aesthetics. And we might have been distracted because the patient may have come in talking about aesthetics and the fact that they want to be made look like a film star. The orthodontist who misses decalcification around the bracket. And you're thinking, Stevie Wonder would have seen this. <laughs> yeah. But maybe the orthodontist wasn't looking for decalcification. Maybe the orthodontist was so distracted by how straight or how crooked the teeth were. Or maybe it was a difficult day with the patient and the parent. We see caries and not perio, or the hygienists who see perio and not caries. We see a nuisance patient, but not the frightened person. So what we're reading is a pain in the arse is actually just a patient who's anxious, which if we dealt with properly, would be a wholly different patient. And we see great dentistry, but not the flaws. So what we see what we do, and we think it's great, but we don't see what we don't do. We don't, we don't see the invisible gorillas in our own work. Now what's interesting is if we have two people, so did you miss or see the gorilla? Yes. You, yeah. I suppose that's a correct answer to the question <laughs> that I've asked. Did you see the gorilla? Yeah. Yes. Did you see the gorilla? Yes. Did you see the gorilla? Yep. Yep. No. So, that's okay, sir. As I told you, I was going to find a guy. It's always a guy. Anyway, you didn't see the gorilla. So, if I'd said to you, make me a record of the video you've just seen, you'd have bet your bottom dollar that there was no gorilla there. And you'd have bet your bottom dollar that there was a gorilla there. And if that was a court, as we call that a court case, patient saying, he never said this, Yes, I did. And so we have two completely different accounts, yet both watched the same video and both recalled it. If I put the two of you together, at least you'll find out there's an anomaly and you might actually rerun and see. But we can't rerun life. And so you have a third set of eyes in the room in dentistry, which is unique in healthcare. It's called our nurse, our assistant, whatever. And so using two sets of eyes independently to look at situations is really valuable. For example, if you're in a practice where there's a number of dentists, you could actually do reviews of your radiographs together and see how many, and you have to look independently because otherwise you get group talk. So you need to look independently and see how, how much difference there is between you in what you see. The reason is distraction. And distraction, hungry, angry, late and tired, which I'll mention a few times, Noise, those of you who have a lot of noise in your surgeries. Distraction, radio. But other distraction is your emotional state. If you're having a bad day, then you're more at risk. And if you're having a bad day, I'm not saying stay away from work because you're losing income. But you might turn to your nurse that morning and say, you need to be extra vigilant today and have your own signals for when the nurse sees a gorilla and you don't. So my first strategy is to avoid selective inattention, which is what this is called. Minimize distraction and have more than one person check independently on the key things. Now, you're not going to do this all the time, but that ulcer, for example, that you think is just an aphthous ulcer, which could be an oral cancer, maybe a second person checking might see something you didn't. That patient who's back for the third time and you can't see what's happening, you can't see the pathology, maybe someone else might be able to. So it's those sort of situations where there's ambiguity that if you have a second person who can check, it's really beneficial. Another thing I want to talk about, I spoke about pattern matching. You see, how the human works is pattern matching. Have, has anyone heard of intuitive thinking versus logical thinking? Again, it's right through the literature. There's a book out there at the moment, Thinking Fast and Slow, by Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky. As humans, we're default intuitive thinkers. The problem is intuition gets better and better the more experience you get. So old idiots like me, generally our intuition can be relied upon more unless we can't see gorillas. And that happens as we develop in our career or with the amount of experience we have. So someone who's had little experience in 30 years 
is every bit as bad as someone who's had the same experience in 10 years. But we pattern match. And that's how I can pick someone I know out in a crowd. It's also how I can miss someone in the crowd. It's because I wasn't expecting them. So you could actually walk past someone you know when you're thinking of something else. And they suddenly stop you and say, hi. And you say, I never saw you there, because you didn't. It's one of the reasons, for example, the research behind mobile phones and driving works on the basis of distraction. Too many invisible gorillas like cyclists, other cars, people, shops, buildings. <laughs> things that are easy to miss. But one of the things we do when we pattern match is we have this thing called representativeness. And it's, it is a bias that humans have. And a great study in dentistry by Thea and Handelman says that we actually attach labels to patients or families. So we have nasty patients, horrible patients, nice patients, difficult patients. And you may have heard in your practice someone say, that whole family are trouble. So if I say to you, people who break appointments, you've got an immediate vision, haven't you? People who turn up late, an immediate vision. People who greet you saying, I hate dentists. An immediate vision. I used to say, fantastic, we're made for each other. <laughs> okay? What a coincidence. And so that's called representative. Now, when we actually attach a negative trait to somebody, we greet them differently. Okay, so we become quite grumpy in the way we greet them. We send all the wrong nonverbal language. The nonverbal language says, I'm actually bored with you, I don't want to be with you. And you can watch people in Starbucks do this. Degree to which we listen, we stop listening to them. Really important. We heard Michael talk about the importance of connecting with patients and respect. You can't respect someone if you're not listening to them. The amount of information we provide is less, really important in consent. And involvement of patient in decision making. We actually become more paternalistic with patients we don't like. And if there's anything we need to do with patients we don't like is to get less paternalistic. It's to make them make their own decisions. Because people tend not to criticize their own decisions. They will criticize yours. And when you're most at risk is an emergency situation, because everyone's panicking in an emergency. It doesn't matter what happens in an emergency, everyone panics. Unless you work in an accident in an emergency, and even then they kill enough people there. Fear and anxiety. Difficult interactions. Time-limited decisions. So if you're running behind time, you're much more at risk, because you're trying to catch up. There's that distraction. And hungry, angry, late, and tired. Okay, so keep eating. Don't get angry. Stay on time and sleep well. That's what pilots have to do. So my second strategy is to avoid labeling patients. Every time you hear yourself label a patient as difficult, ask yourself a question, is there another reason why I might be giving this patient this label? Is there a possible reason, valid reason, why they might be late all the time? Why they might never pay on time? Why they may break appointments? Other than the fact that you might think they're a malingerer. Just by asking yourself that question is called reframing. It doesn't actually matter whether you're right or wrong. It completely opens your mind and stops you being a victim of what's called the rep representativeness heuristic. Treat all patients with respect and formality. And that's really important because it, you don't know a lot of the patients first time in. And there's a difference, you see, even in my generation, my parents' generation would never have greeted somebody with a, their first name. I've greeted people with first name most of my life. But just simply say, asking the patient, the patient first time you meet them is, how would you like me to address you, Mr. So-and-so, or Mrs. So-and-so? What would you like me to call you? you know? or rather than just say, you know, call me John, say, what would you like me to call you, and how, you know, please, how do you want to address me? But just asking that actually strikes a connection with the patient, and says to the patient, this is someone who treats me with respect, and they treat me with respect for the formality that I might want, or the informality that I might want. And then rehearse managing challenges and emotions. Your practice meetings should be rehearsing all the difficult situations that you hate. Because the better you get at the skills, the less gorillas you'll miss. We have a workshop that we've just introduced in the UK called Difficult Interactions. And there's a model in that which has got three things to it. And again, in terms of a structure, it's a three-hour workshop that you can go on as members of DPL for, for free. And it'll take you through the skill base of learning how to apply this in practice. And this is how almost every difficult interaction you come across in life can be managed. But the sequence is really important. The first is, 
always acknowledge where the other person's coming from. There's a, a reflex that we have as humans called the writing reflex. If I don't agree with you, my first thing is to say, is to tell you how I feel. You're wrong because of this. It's called the writing reflex. And the writing reflex gets from a patient the writing reflex back, and you end up in an argument. So whenever you have a difficult interaction, the first thing is if I understand it right, I did a real treatment for you last week, you've been in pain since, have I got that right? And what's he going to say if that's the case? He'll say yes or no, or he'll correct me. And then I say, would it be helpful if I explained where I, what I think is happening? So your position comes second. And then the third is discuss the solution. So many, many people have difficult interactions where they end up fighting over what's happened as opposed to finding out what the person wants to move forward and actually discussing a solution. So that's just a very quick model, but it's the one that that workshop teaches. So please go on the workshop and learn it. But for today, what I'm trying to get across is the sequence. In any difficult interaction, always acknowledge the other person first before you put your own view and then become solution focused. Never argue about what your disagreements only try and discuss solutions. So we might have some days where we feel we're, we're here. So let's look at what's challenging and more predictable. One of the problems that we have is that we live in a very complex world and we use jargon and we, we tell patients to do things. We're just going to have a little, this is called the monk help desk. This is a monk who's struggling with his text. Du, du, Ansgar? Ja! Så er det, ja. Ja, så bra, ok. Ja, hei du. Jeg fatter det. Hei du. Ja. Ja, hva gjelder det? Ehm, uh, ja, det er det her. Ja, vil du sitte? Takk. Ja. Ja, Ja, så den, jeg har ikke fått gjort noen ting hele formiddag, ja. Okay, nei, jeg beklager at det tar tid, altså. Skjønner vi holder på å legge om til et helt nytt system, og da skal alle ha hjelp på en gang, vet du. Ja, ja. Uh, så du kommer ikke inn i den, eller? Nei, den bare ligger der. Ok, har du forsøkt å åpne den? Jeg åpnet den, altså hvis det hadde vært så enkelt, så hadde jeg jo ikke tilkalt help til, skal det vel? Nei, det er sant. Nei, nei. Du har lyst på en plan? Nei da, det skal være fort gjort, jeg tenker jeg vil se. Eh, du bare gjør... Der. Sånn. Ja. Da er vi i gang. Ja, altså så langt kom jeg også. Ok. Men, men, men så stoppet det opp, og så var jeg redd for at noe av teksten skulle forsvinne, ja. så jeg turte ikke å gå videre. Å oh, ja, ok. Nei, men du skjønner at inni her, mm -hmm. så ligger det kanskje flere hundre sider med laget tekst. Mm -hmm. Så for å komme videre, så tar du tak i et, et ark, mm. på den måten her, og så liksom, blar du over på neste side sånn, da fortsetter teksten der. Jeg blar altså? Du blar, ja. Men, men når jeg skal tilbake da? Nei, da bare blar du tilbake igjen, tar tak der, og så, og liksom, der, så er du tilbake til den teksten du hadde sa, ikke noe... Ok, så den slutter der, ja. og så... Så fortsetter den der, ja. Ok, men, men når, når jeg skal avslutte for dagen, hva gjør da? Da bare slår du sammen permene. Ja. På den måten der. Sånn. Der er lukket, der ligger alt lagret inni der. Altså, jeg risikerer ikke å miste noe av teksten her nå. Nei, alt ligger lagret inni her nå. Ja. Da må du i tilfelle sette fyr på, eller ja, det er kanskje lite sannsynlig. Så. Ja, ok. Nei, men for det er noe med det at liksom, når du har holdt på med, med, med skriftruller, ja. så, så tar det litt tid å, 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 å konvertere til å bla i en, i en bøk. Ja, mm. ja. ja. Jeg har jo måttet litt. Er det er greit? Ja, ja, men du, jeg, jeg, før, før det går. Jeg må bare gå igjennom en, en gang til. Altså, jeg, jeg åpner... Ja. Sånn, ja, og så, hva du kalte det? Blar. Jeg blar. Ja, blar i det. Blar frem og tilbake. Ja, og når, sånn, ligger der helt ligger, Ja, og når jeg, når jeg skal, er ferdig, så bare lukker jeg den. Nei. Flott. Hitt det. Kjempefin. Ja, flott det. Nei, men du, vei, vei, vei. Ikke sant? Nei. Nå er det sånn igjen, nå får jeg ikke åpnet den. Nå får jeg ikke åpnet den. Nei, det er fra feil side. Du åpner, du åpner, du åpner, du åpner fra, fra andre siden. Så det er ikke likegyldig det, altså? Nei, åpner fra den siden der. Sånn. Der. Der er den åpnet. Ja vel. Har ah, du okay. lest manualen eller? Manualen? Jeg skal følge med som manual og så bruker vi veiledning. Den sitter den der. Der vet du. Åh oh, ja, I den ja. Den står alt sammen. Ja, ja men ikke sant, der har du samme problemet. Mm. Får den ikke opp. Så åpner den også. Ok, det skulle vi kanskje ha tenkt på. So maybe we should have thought. And one of the problems is we actually create a lot of awkward situations with patients. Because we don't ask them what they know. Some patients know a lot about, so just asking a patient, what do you know about gum disease? What do you mean gum disease? What do you know about periodontal disease? And they might be able to give you the lecture, or they might not. And again, if we assume knowledge that's not there, because we have it and it's easy for us because it's every day for us, and we use jargon, then we will create more awkward situations. And not everyone is on the same page as we've just seen. There's another thing that we need to be willing to challenge, 
And the beauty of challenging it when you come into a situation is you bring fresh eyes. You're at the stage in the career where you will actually move around many of you. There's a famous experiment called the Five Gorilla Experiment. And with five gorillas in a cage, one will elect himself the silverback, and they put a bunch of bananas in the cage. And so the gorilla would go for the bananas. But what they did was they hosed that gorilla down with ice cold water and hosed the other four gorillas as well. Now, I'm allowed to be informed by my friends in the gorilla family that they don't like ice water. And the gorilla didn't get banana. And so he sat back and he wondered for a while. And then he decided to go for the bananas again, and they hosed him down with ice cold water and all his four friends, which wasn't popular. And so he decided, I'm not going for the bananas. At which stage, another gorilla said, well, now I must be the alpha male, and I'll go for them myself. And guess what? They hosed him down and all four other gorillas. And by the time they got to the third or fourth gorilla, as soon as one gorilla would go for the bananas, the other four would jump on him and beat him up. <laughs> Which is what I would do if I was going to get hosed down with ice cold water and someone was doing that. And then when they got all five gorillas so that none of them would go for the bananas, they took one gorilla out and put another gorilla in. And guess what? That gorilla decided, I'm going for the bananas. But they didn't need to hose him because the other four beat him up. And then they have gradually, one at a time, replaced every gorilla until there was no gorilla in that cage who'd ever been hosed down with water. And yet, if any gorilla went for the bananas, they beat him up. Now, you wonder why that's there. Have you ever got, been in touch with a rule and you know, people are saying, is this the way it's always been done? Nobody has a clue why. Nobody has a clue what benefit, but nobody challenges it. And so that's the, it's about social conditioning. And many of the problems we get into in the workplaces we go into is because we will immediately adopt the rules of the practices and the places and the hospitals that we go into. Mid-staffs, again, is a classic example of a poisonous culture into which good professionals went and immediately became very institutionalized. And so I'm going to encourage you is that if you're in a situation where you have a lot of awkward situations in the practice, challenge every rule that you think contributes to it. You have that role. Another way in which we're predictable is that there's, and we're only beginning to cop on, is there's differences between the way in which males and females communicate. And there are five subtle differences. First is that women don't speak properly. <laughs> now, I'll give you an example. Because my guess is you guys think that men don't listen. Isn't that right? Yeah? We do listen, boys, don't we? For God's sake, stand up for yourselves. <laughs> I'm up here trying to do my best on behalf of the male race, and come on, do we listen, guys? Yes. yes. I'll give you an example of the Tiernan household. When I get home from work and I say to my, my wife, says, would you like to go to the pictures? And I say, no. <laughs> very, very straight question. Now, it takes the average man about 45 minutes to recognize the dangers of silence. <laughs> At which stage I say, are you okay? ultra-sensitive man that I am. My wife says, I'm fine. <laughs> Still not recognizing the danger that I'm in, a few minutes later I say, are you sure you're okay? You don't seem yourself tonight. I said, I'm fine. <laughs> now I think you girls have figured out that language, haven't you? <laughs> would you like to go out means not would you like to go out, it means I'd like to go out. How am I to know this? That's a hint. I don't get hints. <laughs> I'm fine means I'm not fine. How am I to know this? <laughs> I said I'm fine means you're an insensitive bastard. How am I meant to supposed to know all this? <laughs> bottom line last. Bottom line first. Why do we stop listening is because the stereotypical female conversation is lots of words. <laughs> Hundreds and thousands of them. Somewhere towards the end of all this is the meaning. <laughs> the stereotypical male has got no words. <laughs> we just look for the bottom line first and stop listening. And when we don't hear the bottom line, we don't get it. So if you want males to get it more, give them bottom line first and last. Okay? This is Sarah Deborah Tannen's work in in the US has done a tremendous amount of work on this, but consultation-wise is that if you're asked a question, for example, what do you think of that tooth? I don't want you to become a psychologist overnight, 
But by just reflecting the question back and saying, that's a really interesting question, why do you ask? Then you've got around whether it's a stereotypical male or female. If it's a stereotypical female language, they say, what a sensitive dentist, fantastic. And a stereotypical male says, no reason, and you know the answer. So you don't have to actually ask, are you stereotypical male or female? Reflecting questions back is a great way of getting around it. Multitasking, remember multitasking, single tasking? There's a great book by Lucopolis called The Multitasking Myth. Women are multi-switchers, not multitaskers. But multitasking, it's distraction, okay? Pick up signals, pick up signals. Women pick up signals much more than men. Much more hot wired to pick up signals. So body language, so women sort of feel, I'm not sure I like that patient. And you're probably right. You probably don't always trust your intuition. What it brings is ambiguity. It doesn't give you the right to slap them. But, but it, it, what it means is you question and say, there's something going off. My alarm is going off. Whereas the guy is in there going, hi, how are you? Lovely to see you. Do you have a family? Would you like one? All of this sort of stuff <laughs> is going on, okay? But you can be trained around it. And then the final is our decision making is quite different. They're very predictable. Women are verifiers. I bring my shopping with my good wife. Should we go to the first shop? She picks something up that she likes. She knows she likes it. She knows it fits. It looks great. I know it's great. I know it's exactly what she wants. She hugs it, feels it, and puts it down. And we leave that shop. <laughs> and we go to another one. And she picks it up, and she hugs it, and she feels it, and she puts it down. And I'm saying, but it's back there, the one you want. Another shop. <laughs> and this goes on seven or eight times, until eventually she says, I think I'll go back to the first place. <laughs> okay? Guys, we're different. We're pre-programmed from reptilian times to go out with a spear, hunting. <laughs> Women think that they'll give us a list and we'll bring something back on it. That's not the way we are. We bring nothing back from the list. We go hunting with the spear <laughs> and we see a shop and in we go quickly. We will grab something, spear it, pay for it hopefully, take it out <laughs> and take it home. At which stage my wife says, if you think I'm going out with you wearing that, that's a completely different thing. So we're quite impulse purchasers. Really important in consent for big treatments because what it actually means is you're in no rush to take consent from either. Firstly because stereotypical female wants to verify and the male is probably making the wrong decision. Can't be trusted. Okay? Multitasking, please don't distract males. Can't do two things at once. I have to turn down the radio to park. Please don't distract me. <laughs> At least I can park. That's a different issue. <laughs> one up for the guys, one up for the guys. Okay. Okay, so what do I say now? So now we've got a problem. Right, something goes wrong. A really awkward situation is when something goes wrong. What we want is patient satisfied. Some background information. If you make a human connection and you actively listen and you convey empathy and you seek patient's input and you check for their understanding, they're the five safest skills you will ever develop in your clinical life. That's what will keep you safe. See, 66% of lawsuits have no, no evidence of negligence. So why would someone sue when there's no evidence? And it's usually because these things have gone wrong. What's it like waiting to see a dentist? What do you think? Do you wake up on a Sunday morning and say, come on, to your partner, let's go out and have a couple of crowns done. Thought we'd treat ourselves today. Okay? What sort of motivation does it take to come and sit in one of our rooms? What sort of motivation does it come sit in one of our rooms when you're nervous and you've got a mouthful of grot? Huge, isn't it? It's huge motivation. And we often mis mistake that. We often mistake the patient who's sitting there with a dirty mouth as they're not interested. They really are interested, otherwise they wouldn't be sitting with you. And, but what happens is, what do you do when you're sitting in your dentist's waiting room or your doctor's waiting room? What are you rehearsing? Your story, isn't it? You, know, you don't go to your doctor and the doctor says, why are you here? And say, I have no idea. <laughs> Let me think. Let me have a think for a moment. 
it was cold. <laughs> no. The doctor says, right, why are you here? And you push the play button. And off you go. Okay? And your story's full of noise. You see, as a patient story, patients don't come in and say, hi, my name is John. I'm 53. I have an upper right six. I think the marginal ridge is fractured. Because <laughs> you're thinking, I either have a dentist or a nutter. Okay, it's one of the two. <laughs> but it's not someone who's normal. <coughs> Instead, what you say is, why are you here? Hi, I'm John. Oh, I've got here today on the bus. Have you used that new bus service that they have around here? Anyway, got to tell you, I was in a restaurant the other night, and I got some pain when I bit down that new restaurant down the end, the Greek restaurant, yeah? Do you like Greek food? And you're thinking, oh, come on, we have a talker. We have a talker. <laughs> okay? It's a bit like when you're sitting on a plane. The one thing I don't w ever want is a talker next to me at night. <laughs> I have a talker. You're sitting on, you're going, oh, hi, hi, how are you? Oh, God, no. <laughs> okay? So I have a whole series of business cards from other people that I give them. Someone out there thinks I'm the chairman of Air France at the moment. Okay? Don't do that with patients. Don't tell them you're someone different if they're a talker. Start listening. It's different. So the first two minutes are the key to your danger. Patients have their story. They tell you the story is very important. That really is. They, most patients will speak for 90 seconds. Dentists interrupt an average between 15 and 30 seconds. The work of Williams and Ogden has shown this. Try this with a friend. Get the friend to tell you their story and about 15 seconds in say, do you mind if I ask you the time? And they give you the time. And then, oh sorry, I interrupted her. And they start again. They don't start from where they were. They start usually at the start again. And then this time wait about 10, 15 seconds extra and say, are you sure that's the time? <laughs> and watch them get irritated. Okay? They will get irritated. Only do this to a friend you want to lose. Okay? <laughs> Patients may not let you move on until they've told their story. Remember, that's why they've come, to tell you their story. And we wonder why consultations take a long time. If we let them speak, the work of Wendy Levinson shows that consultations are shorter, more effective. Patients think you listen. And if you don't listen, patients will feel rushed or that you're not interested. And your nonverbal communication is critical. So if you're turned to the side, almost ready to run at the old instrumentation, and the patient's over there. So it's an acting game. You've got to pretend to that patient that you are so interested in what they say. You've got to get your verbal and nonverbal language coincident. Because the patient's rapid assessment is, are you listening? Do you care? Are you going to get this right? If I see any of you as a dentist tomorrow, are you listening to me? My story? Are you listening for me? Do you care? And if the answer is yes and yes, then my confidence in you getting it right is huge. And if we go back to the video at the start with Andrew, that young dentist, and Mrs. Wiener, well, was he listening? Maybe. But he came across as quite uncertain. And so the patient took advantage of that. We have a six-month program for dentists with very high risk, where we go away and work with them with actors on their hot buttons. And these are dentists who may perform perfectly most of the time, but just when they get the wrong type of patient, they sort of blow up and scream at them. And so we work with these dentists, and we teach them a model called clear communication, but there's three words in terms of really important, about connecting, listening, and empathize. The first is to connect with someone really welcoming, smiling eye contact, subject to culture. Some cultures, of course, don't have eye contact. They look down, so you must always be cognizant of that. But in the UK, people are used to our culture. But in other parts of the world, Aboriginal in, in Australia, for example, you would never make direct eye contact. It would be taken as, as, as um, quite uh, a, a formal insult sometimes. But normally, smiling eye contact. And it doesn't mean following the patient around the room, staring at them. Okay? That's a bit... Hmm. Greeting the patient by name, formal name, introducing yourself. Making an introductory comment unrelated. So, did you have trouble getting here today? You've done well getting here with the traffic out there, depending on where you are. But just a comment that's nothing. If you know it's a patient you've seen before, how are the family? How is that holiday? Something totally unconnected. It just makes a connection. And then listening involves ver verbal and nonverbal behaviors. I'm not into this thing if you've got one, uh, one, one mouth and two ears, because the problem is when you're listening, you've got a lot of spare time, haven't you, with some patients? 
you're, you're listening to them and you're going and every so often you hear a word that's interesting like tooth <laughs> and you sort of wake up pain no more than this was it hot was it cold okay so and some patients just just go on and on and on but when you're listening if, you, if I'm looking at you when you're listening, I can sleep with my eyes open. I've been doing that in marriage for 35 years. So I mean, that's how I survive, how my wife survives when she's listening to me. Open body posture, a look of interest and concern. Oh, right, yeah. Minimal encouragers, a nodding head. I don't mean as in the old ad with Churchill. Oh, yeah, still. <laughs> and so there's behaviors that confirm listening, like and then, and, and what else happened. So you can actually, they're called encouragers. But what we want to do for empathy is to summarize to ensure the patient knows they've been heard and understood. The content and the emotion. Because that's what empathy is. Empathy is not something we feel for the patient. That's sympathy. Empathy is not something we do. Empathy is something the patient experiences when they feel that you understand the content of what they say and the emotion with which they say it. So... We're back to that root treatment. So I did a root treatment for you last week. You've been in pain. In fact, you ended up in hospital. Really sorry to hear that. And you've been up all night now for two nights before getting to me. You tried to get us on the emergency service on Saturday and couldn't. And if I understand, you're pretty angry and you're concerned that it may be something that we did that was wrong. Have I got that right? Now, it's difficult for me to ask him, and you've lost confidence in me, or you think I've done something wrong. But actually, the power of that statement is that I'm able to tell them, I understand what you're saying, and I understand the emotion behind it. It's a huge connector between you and a patient, even an angry patient. And one of the quickest ways to resolve an awkward situation. It's very different from sympathy. So when you adopt their body language or whatever, when you listen and summarize their story back to them, when you acknowledge the emotion, and you pick up and respond to cues, then that's empathy. And you've got to, I think this slide is in your notes. Patients struggle if we use jargon. And matching vocabulary with a patient is really important. If you take the time to ask a patient what they understand, and every time you say jargon or a dental term which comes natural to us, have a phrase which means, then it really shows the patient that you're respecting their position and you're not talking down to them. And that was the famous research by Williams and Ogden about how often we, we do it. One of the things we find very difficult, tone of voice is really important. And this was the study by Wendy Levinson and Rich Frankel. And what they did was they picked a group of doctors, not dentists, doctors who'd been sued a lot and doctors who'd never been sued. And they got these conversations and they took 10 seconds at the start of the conversation and 10 seconds at the end. Untrained were able to predict which doctors were in the high risk group 75% of the time. And Ambadi and Aplant, who were PhD students of Wendy Levinson's at the time, did the very same. Except they jumbled up the words so they couldn't even hear the words. So your tone of voice gives you away. And so to get around that, you've actually got to convince yourself you're going to like this patient. You've got to say positively to yourself, I'm going to like this patient in advance. And that's difficult. And so the real lesson is the more you dislike them, the more you try and like them. And that's hard because some people really make it difficult for you to like them. So an example, you've had a lot of pain. It's just like the pain you had years ago when no one could diagnose it. Now you're very worried and upset that it's come back again and maybe related to this problem. That's reflecting content and emotion. You seem to be telling me your pain's getting more difficult to manage and your family aren't very sympathetic, and see it's causing you a lot of distress, is that right? It's reflective listening, probably the most powerful tool you have. Picking up and responding to patients' cues. It's all there. Okay, so what do we do when we get it wrong? Well, the good news is only one to three percent of patients claim after a serious adverse outcome. So 97 percent of patients who know you've damaged them will not make a claim against you. The Mori poll, 2002, in the UK, which looked at complaints, including dentistry, the very same figures. 97% of patients who you harm 
or who feel that you've harmed them will not make a complaint. They'll just go elsewhere or they forgive you or whatever. So it's, I know we're in a highly litigious society and I know that we get sued more often in Britain than they do in the US as dentists, but the reality is it's still only once or twice in a career. So we shouldn't be going to, you know, it's a bit like Crime Watch. We shouldn't be going to bed thinking that someone's going to break in. What do patients want after an adverse outcome? Now, Tom Gallagher, at least 98% of patients want to be told the truth. The other 2% were lying. Okay? I cannot believe anyone wouldn't want to be told the truth after an adverse outcome. I can hear those CPD pages opening as we speak. A truthful discussion to have their story heard. And notice that this is very like what patients want when they come to see you. Information to their level of satisfaction, in other words, no jargon, an expression of regret, information on how similar outcomes will be prevented, and an agreed plan. And the hardest word, of course, for us to learn to say in dentistry is sorry. The word sorry is a great word in the English language. When I'm trying to teach this in Hong Kong, there's 40 different words between Mandarin and Cantonese, and they all mean something different. In English, one word means a lot. It's great. I say sorry all the time at home, and half the time I don't mean it. But, I mean, the whole thing is, it's, sorry is a great word, and it's a really healing word in the English language. Do you have to say it? No, you can say things like sorry. So, you know when you're late on a plane and someone says, we'd like to apologize to passengers for the late arrival, or do you think they're sorry? No, it doesn't really have sounded. But if they said, ladies and gentlemen, those of you waiting for the plane to Dublin tonight, uh, the plane's late. Uh, we recognize this is going to irritate a lot of you who are trying to get to the match tomorrow. Uh, we'll give you another announcement in half an hour, and there's coffee available at Starbucks. We'll talk to you in half an hour. How would you feel then? Not so bad. <coughs> I haven't said sorry, but I've said words like it. What I've, in the second half, I've actually conveyed that I am sorry, and in the first, I've said sorry and not conveyed that I have. Ever hear a politician say sorry? Does it sound like it? I'm sorry if you feel I upset you. Oh, that really irritates me. Looking at the literature, what do patients want when something goes wrong? Now, most people think they want money, but it's less than 25% want money. Now, in dentistry, that's probably higher because the cost of remedial treatment is what they want. But they want to correct efficient standards of care. I want I want to tackle you because I want to make sure it doesn't happen to somebody else. And if I said to you, would you prefer to treat a theatre nurse or a litigation specialist lawyer, which would you prefer? Who, who would go for the litigation specialist lawyer by choice? Hands up. And who'd go for the theatre nurse by choice? Okay. Do you want the good news? Who's more likely to sue you? The theatre nurse by a long way, okay? Because the litigation specialist knows the court's a lottery and they'd only go for cases that they get. People who are socially minded like healthcare workers, teachers, far more likely to try and take you out. To receive an explanation and apology, to enforce accountability, to ensure compensation. Again, look at mid-staffs, look at the people who drove that inquiry. They weren't after money, they were after the first three. And it's the same when you do something wrong. So, if we concentrate on the first three, then that's great. Key elements of the response, acknowledgement, a meaningful expression of regret, let the patient tell their story, discuss solutions, and don't abandon the patient. And you'll notice a theme going on through this. It's about acknowledging the other person. It's about getting that connection. It's about learning to say sorry or words that mean it. Hearing the patient, discussing solutions, not disagreeing, not fighting and not abandoning the patient. Okay, so in the last few minutes, I'm going to give you five principles of complaints handling, and it really doesn't matter which complaint system you're in. Private NHS, and this has nothing to do with the rules of complaints, it's five human emotions that make a difference. The first is, you can go on the DPI website and download this, if you want the st which rules to follow or the system, they're the five things, recognition, empathy, action, compensation, and honesty, and I'll talk about those quickly. Acknowledging a complaint without being defensive. Sad but glad technique. James, I'm really sorry to hear we've upset you, but I'm glad you've told me. Don't try that at home. 
Okay, it sounds sarcastic. Okay, I'm really sorry that you've come back with pain, but I'm glad you've given us an opportunity to explain to you what's happened. I'm really sorry to hear that you feel that we didn't treat you properly, but I'm really glad you've given me an opportunity to look into it. Wendy Levinson, Sabogad technique. Empathy, which we've spoken about, and I'm not going to repeat, but if you have empathy in your response to a complaint, so you acknowledge the content and the emotion, the chances of that person taking that complaint further, like going to the GDC or going to a lawyer, are next to nil. And so you get one opportunity at this, because if you give them the impression that you don't understand what they're saying or you're not listening, they take it further. It's so tempting because of our fight or flight situation to hide when we get a complaint. And it's the one thing that you really need to run at. Is a friend of mine in South Africa runs a hotel chain called Protea, Arthur Gillis. And his basic motto in his hotel business is if we have a problem, let's run like hell at it, not away from it. So the quicker you run at and act, the better. By compensation, Probably the best work out in the customer service industries is by Chip Bell and Harry Zemke. And they, if you look at what the Charles Vinson found in his study after an adverse outcome, it's very similar. People want, a, sorry, fix it. They want empathy. I want you to understand what it felt like. Symbolic atonement, I want to make sure this doesn't happen to somebody else. And I want you to stay with me. See, I complain because I want to stay in your practice, or whatever. Most complaints, and the funny thing is, if you deal with a complaint successfully, that person becomes more loyal and less likely to complain again. And most, under, most other industries have worked this out. That's why complaints handling is really important at a local level. And finally, honesty. And one of the problems that you have in honesty is that when you're frightened and you think your career is gone, like that, you know, when I have the two preps that don't match, what happens if the patient says, was this supposed to happen? You have a straight choice, yes or no. So tempting to try and bullshit the patient and get out of it. And that's when, if you don't answer truthfully, that's when it really is a problem. Don't tell lies, don't alter the history by taking the records and rewriting them, and don't speculate. And many, many people actually admit to things that they've never done because they're so frightened and they want to please the patient. So that's where you take advice from DPL, from your advisors, or from your own defense organization. It's different. And so we're going to finish a little bit on clinical records. It's now a criminal offense to alter a clinical record, and we now have people around the world going to prison for altering them. That never happened 30 years ago when I came into the profession. Most of the people I've seen alter records over my career in DPL and I also sat on the GDC Condo Committee and a range of other committees didn't do it out of maliciousness, they did it out of fear. There are one or two who did it out of maliciousness and fraud, but that's a different issue. Please don't do it, that's the first thing. When we have a record like this, I'd be grateful if you would arrange the following teeth under local anesthesia. Which tooth do you think was extracted there? Six and a four, so what do we have? We have ambiguity. Whenever we have ambiguity, we need to try and resolve it. Now, if we're going to design our systems, you see, the practice that did this actually was a good practice, because let me show you the real letter. Okay? And so what the practice is, they have the words upper right first premolar, and they have that. But is that a satisfactory defense? Because that could still be a six. And the person writing it might have mistaken it and written down first premolar. And so even with that, where you might think it's safe, what I'm going to suggest is that your strategy for dealing with ambiguity is always go back to source and make sure the person... So I would phone that practice anyway. And I'd speak and I'd say, I want you to check that it is. And if they couldn't be absolutely sure, then they'd see the patient again. And that's how you stay safe. Every time you see ambiguity, you run it right back to source and follow it through. Just to make sure. Why? Because at the end of the day, we're there trying to make patients safer. When we keep clinical records, the first I said our eyes are not videos. That's true. And our memories are flawed. 
the average amount of stuff we can keep in a short-term memory is seven things. If we're getting distraction, it's probably four or three. If you're writing your notes up at the end of a session, you have a problem. Even writing notes up 30 minutes after a visit, you'll forget most of the good stuff. And we have a third person in the room who can write good notes. The only thing I would say is memory is constructed on expectations and experience. It's a bit like the invisible gorilla. Write down the conversations. They're probably the most key thing that we see missing from clinical records. Probably the biggest reason why dentists lose cases. Probably the biggest reason why dentists feel embittered if they feel they've done right and a patient makes an allegation that they can't satisfactorily defend. And that embitterment stays with you for years. And there's three things I'd suggest on notes. I call them my three C's of records. And that's comprehensive. I'm not going to tell you what comprehensive notes are. You know what they are and you know what they're not. Contemporaneous means now. You have a nurse with you most of the time you're taking notes who's actually witnessing the conversation. Why wouldn't he or she write it down? In which case it takes no extra time at the end. And because it's happening at the time, you're not reliant on your short-term memory to remember the good points. And if I'm relying on my short-term memory, then this gentleman is going to miss the gorilla, and this lady is going to get the gorilla. Whereas if the nurse writes the notes at the time, and we compare them at the end, so me and my nurse look at the notes, then we've got two independent viewpoints. And you might pick up some of the gorillas you've missed in conversations. And so it's comprehensive, it's contemporaneous, and record the conversations. I don't mean record on video camera or record on audio. I mean write them down. Everyone can see the treatment in the mouths. So I hope in the last bit of time that I've given you a few things to think of. It's, uh, it's a delight. I'd like to say it's a delight to be here late in a Saturday afternoon. I'm not going to. But uh, no, it's been a pleasure to speak to you again, and I'm happy to take a few questions. Thank you very much.